This is episode 661 of the Rio Grande Foundation's Tipping Point New Mexico. I'm Paul Gessing. And I'm Wally Drangmeister. I'm president of the Rio Grande Foundation, New Mexico's free market think tank. You can find out more about the foundation at riograndefoundation.org. Well, Wally, uh, hopefully I'm not the first, but uh, I'm happy to wish you a happy Thanksgiving. You and the Mrs. Carol, so I uh, hope you enjoy. Any uh, big plans sticking around? Are you going? Oh, we have some uh, some family, the, uh, the daughters coming in, so hopefully I have a good time really looking forward to it. And a happy Thanksgiving to you and your family, Paul. All right, yeah. It's, uh, the holidays are starting to really hit. It's, uh, you know, I consider Halloween the beginning <laughs> of the holiday season because <laughs> Halloween has gotten so big. Uh, as an adult, I mean, it was a big deal when you were a kid, but uh, you know, it seems like just the holidays go from Halloween uh, to Thanksgiving to Christmas to New Year's, and it's um, it's a great time of year. And uh, looking forward to some more of that uh, cool weather here, and uh, possibly some more snow for the the ski areas. But uh, we've got plenty to talk about, even in a holiday week here. And uh, you know, while Trump has got his uh, his cabinet filled out. We've got plenty of issues to discuss right here in the land of enchantment. Uh, although one of them relates to the current uh, situation in Washington. Of course, uh, one of the big kind of uh, items of conversation going on right now is all the New Mexico media are asking the New Mexico politicians, who are, of course, all Democrats about how they are going to possibly survive the next four years with a Trump presidency and a Republican Congress, a what I would call center-right Supreme Court. Uh, one of the uh, articles relevant to this appeared in the Albuquerque Journal. And uh, there was a lot said back and forth, most of it, you know, sort of, uninteresting, um, although there are interesting aspects of that discussion. But the thing that really stuck out at me was Javier Martinez, Speaker of the House, saying, if the Trump administration wants to come to New Mexico and learn from what we've done, they are welcome to come. Uh, learn exactly what, Wally? Uh, please, please elaborate <laughs> on behalf of uh, the Speaker of the House. Well, <laughs> Who knows what he he meant? And you know, it's one of those uh, the the initial issue that really has uh, the D's, the governor, and most New Mexico politicians up in arms is uh, something to do with uh, deportation of those that are in the country legally. And uh, you know, it's really interesting where we got to on that point. That's uh, been a source of frustration for me for years to where. You know, New Me uh, the United States wants and needs immigrants. We do. But we just never seem to be able to put a system in place for people to do it illegally. And it's gotten to the point where, largely on the left, they just want to ignore the law at every level, at the federal, state, local, you know, and, and we've seen that from uh, top to bottom during the Biden administration. Uh, they were actually facilitating illegal immigration coming in at the federal level. So that's one item. And so uh, there is a, there's a huge disagreement on, uh, you know, what, how immigration should happen in the United States uh, with uh, the D's basically taking the lawless approach. And uh, up to this point, the R is kind of wringing their hands and uh, saying a lot of things. Although if we look back, uh, you know, President Obama did a decent job of uh, uh, deporting lots and lots of people, which uh, seems to be forgotten in this. Uh, so maybe Trump learned something from Obama, but that's not what the talking point is. Now, on everything else, what could uh, what could the Trump administration possibly learn from New Mexico? Uh, I guess the the bright spot economically, financially, is our oil and gas industry. And so, uh, but here's the thing, oil is where it is. And so that's not an exportable kind of industry where it's like, uh, even if you were a state 
like Arizona would love to be in the oil and gas business. Well, guess what? It's not underneath the surface there in Arizona, so that's not going to happen. Okay, beyond that, what could we possibly do? What program do, you know, uh, the uh, whole idea of federalism, the 50 states, and they can do policies, and the ones that work can grow, even sometimes be federalized. Uh, that's a, I think that's a, a decent a decent system, but we have tended to avoid that over the past many years. We just do things like the Affordable Health Care Act. We just throw them out, you know, and say, we're going to do this all in one fell swoop. We're not going to try a couple of things, see what works. What is it that works in New Mexico, really, that you would say, boy, that's a good policy that would benefit the state surrounding us, even the whole country? Is it education? I don't think so. Is it our approach to taxation and regulation? I don't think so. Is it our approach to crime? Doesn't appear to be. And so uh, what are you left with? You know, it's like, let me just say, uh, I do love the weather in New Mexico, and I do love the art, and I do love the history, and I do love the culture, but those are not, those are not really things that are you would export anyway And in today's kind of uh, terms of wokeism, if you were to try to do that, it wouldn't be celebrated that they were taking our art and culture and putting it elsewhere. It would be called cultural appropriation. So what is it they're going to take away from New Mexico and what can New Mexico prevent from happening? Uh, And then the final point, let's look at what happened the last time uh, Trump was president. How did New Mexico do? Uh, Did quite well, frankly. It was... uh, it, along with the rest of the country, did very well. We do have the little blip that was COVID, and uh, uh, notwithstanding the fact that mistakes were made on both sides on that, that's uh, something, again, that what what can we learn from that? We can learn that uh, maybe, maybe things could be handled differently in the future, but again, not a lesson that we can take to ongoing daily governance uh, going from the United States to the federal level. So, uh, and in the words of uh, Bubba from Forrest Gump, that's all, or that's all I'm going to talk about on that topic. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it's hard to see what policies could possibly be uh, learned about uh, from New Mexico. Uh, obviously, beautiful state, great weather, uh, unique cultures, all those things, but... Uh, the politicians haven't done much to improve New Mexico, or let's put it another way, the politicians are the biggest single problem facing New Mexico, and of course, you know the voters who put them in uh, all the time. So uh, what will New Mexico uh, face in terms of challenges from the Trump administration? Uh, the big one to me remains, uh, it's going to be about cutting government programs and you know i am four square in support of him doing that uh within you know reason and uh strategically of course uh and of course new mexico has ample room to cut federal spending out uh and and is likely to be targeted if the trump administration does decide to uh, address spending and new mexico politicians can squeal and squawk all they want but uh the state should be independent uh, of the federal government in in most ways. We shouldn't be reliant on uh, the wa- Washington D.C. money flowing in to prop up our uh, economy because we have plenty of money. We have the resources to make our state to make our state get great. Let's <laughs> do let's go let's do again. that. Yeah, you know, and Paul, uh, along that line. Um, you know, in the in the Albuquerque Journal this morning, they talk about expanding Medicaid and more Medicaid, more Medicaid, and mm-hmm. because that's something that the more Medicaid we have, the more that Washington pays for it. And we've been in a period where we've ramped up spending to the point where uh, there was once a time where how many how many more trillions can we add to the uh, the debt before things start to get serious? We're there right now, and so if you're going to Hitch a further program to the federal government putting more and more money into New Mexico. 
Uh, that that strategy may work in the short term, but it's way riskier than it used to be uh, from a time point of view. The uh, ticking time bomb that is the uh, the trillions of dollars of debt that uh, the United States uh, Treasury is now responsible for. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, critical that that issue is addressed. Uh, now, kind of a, a topic that we discussed many moons ago, maybe six months ago, uh, but it reared its ugly head again when MLG went on MSNBC Morning Joe to talk about, uh, among other things, and of course she talked about how New Mexico is going to resist the Trump administration on immigration and some other things, but uh, she drops this little bomb in the middle of it. It just shows you how the media do not actually care or uh, function in any real way. Uh, just skepticism, curiosity would have uh, caused a normal, thoughtful human being to uh, say something. So the governor on Morning Joe on MSNBC says that New Mexico went from 50th in child poverty to 17th. She just makes that statement. And of course, the Morning Joe, you know, Scarborough and Mika, they, they don't. Congratulations. No, they don't even say. They, <laughs> just she's like... just, she just keeps rolling on like a steamroller. And I, I'm like, if you as a state did anything that reduced or improved a problem from dead last to 17th, shouldn't you ask said protagonist, Gee, Governor, that's amazing. Let's have a 15-minute conversation about how you would... Drop, how you did that. How you <laughs> dropped child poverty from the 50th ranked state to the 17th best state. It just rolls on. Well, I mean, justifiably, because unbelievably, the media have not questioned. Now, I get it. MSNBC is a bunch of hacks. Okay, whatever. But... Somebody in New Mexico's media, if they were a, not asleep at the switch, would say, why is the governor out here saying that she's dramatically improved child poverty? When what she's saying is that the traditional census poverty measure, we're 50th in, the supplemental measure, which includes all the welfare programs, we're 17th in. Okay, they're two different measurements. That doesn't mean we've improved child poverty. And all of the other analyses, the Voices for Children, Kids Count, and all the others, put us at a very bad position. So I think the Census Bureau, you know, I used to th think that the Census Supplemental Program was maybe more realistic, and maybe it is in some circumstances, but the child living in a place with all of the government benefits is not that much better off than the child without the government benefits. What makes the child better off is the responsibility of the parent to be out there busting their butt, earning a paycheck and being a good example and doing their very best, even if it's barely adequate to bring home a paycheck to feed the kid and clothe the kid and all those. So uh, from that perspective, the supplemental index is, is garbage, but the governor just keeps spouting this crap. Uh, it's just ridiculous. Well, it is interesting. You know, uh, as you said, uh, Voices for Children, the Anna E. Casey Foundation, which is uh, certainly no right-wing think tank, have all put New Mexico towards the bottom. And, uh, you know, this is an issue that when it comes to poverty is, uh, and this is, this is right there, it's whether it's children or not is, how do you count all these government programs? So if right. you're if you're uh, if you are quote unquote poor and you get all of these benefits, does your lifestyle then become one of somebody who's not poor? And so this is a, you know, this is a, a an interesting one because it it's used as a political football. Uh, obviously, the one that it minimizes the the welfare type programs is a better indication of how the state is doing, how the private economy is doing. And in a lot of cases, as you said, that may be the more relevant one, but it doesn't mean the other one's not important. But here's the thing. 
because that one shows us a lot better. Let's just switch to that one. You know, it's one of those things. Uh, we're tired of living in a football world, uh, and not to hit too close to home, Paul, where the Pittsburgh Steelers lose a football game based on how many points are on the scoreboard. We're going to go to who has the tougher looking uniforms All and right. always give them a win. And so, and I give you a, I give you a hard time because I know that your team <laughs> and I know they had a, a very tough loss, but really we're just going to change the scoreboard that we use without any, no segue of any kind. That does just does, that seems disingenuous. And we have seen uh, governor Lujan Grisham latch on to these very positive statistics that are very narrow in their focus and just spout those again and again and again. That has been kind of par for her her administration for the, the six plus years that she's been in there. And so maybe this is more of the same. So uh, if you can't get better policies, just get a better report that shows you're doing better. Yeah, and at the risk of going on at length about this, it's, uh, it does highlight uh, how a good podcast host can who actually knows something can call BS or at least follow up on questions where the mainstream media, and this is generally true for all of them, that they simply are not able to or willing to. Uh, one other quick note on the MSNBC interview is, uh, speaking of things that New Mexico shouldn't have opinions about on the national stage, uh, they asked her about eliminating the Department of Education and how harmful that would be to the state of New Mexico. And I thought, you know, you should sit this one out, Governor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be like uh, asking me, Paul, to uh, comment on what it takes to get in shape to run a marathon. It's like, maybe you should ask somebody that's doing a little better <laughs> with regard to that than me. So, Yeah. Uh, speaking of similar notes relating to children, I encountered a very interesting data set that uh, spurred me on to some little uh, more analysis. Uh, the National Center of Education Statistics has both uh, backward-looking and forward-looking statewide data on public school en enrollment. And, uh, you know, obviously the, the challenge here is that at the state level, at the national level, at the global level, uh, people are not having as many children. So that is a fact. Uh, it varies widely by nation and uh, varies dramatically by state as well. But uh, you're going to see in the years to come a likely decline, no matter where you are in the country, in the number of children enrolled in school, public school particularly. Uh, and that's one of the things that the this center did, I believe it was 2014 was the peak in New Mexico. And there is no sign of us regaining that peak in terms of public school enrollment. Now, uh, what is more troubling is the National Center for Education Statistics projects into the future, and they see between 2022, so they have a few years in the past, uh, and 2031, how much the uh, student population will change. And uh, New Mexico has the third biggest drop, Wally, 15.1%. Uh, 15.1% decline between now and 2031. Seven, really six short years, we're going to see uh, a further shrinkage of the number of children in our public schools, California and Hawaii being the only states to have exceed or to exceed New Mexico, in terms of estimated decline, Colorado at 6.7%, the U.S. as a whole by 55 Of course, Texas, Oklahoma, Arizona, very close to even, no losses, because they're some of the fastest growing states in the country. Utah, amazingly, of course, uh, strong Mormon faith up there with a growth in, of 3%. So, <coughs> um, as New Mexico sees fewer and fewer children in its school system, are we going to shrink spending? Are we going to close schools? Are we are, are teaching jobs going to be less plentiful? I, it seems like we're always in this uh, crisis with the number of teachers. Well, 
part of that's because they uh, continue hiring more and more teachers for the same number of students. Uh, but this is this is a real problem for our state and our country and the world moving forward is the, the birth dearth. Yeah, Paula, you know, I got interested uh, again in uh, in kind of the demographics of the world and uh, New Mexico a few years ago and started to look at this. And so uh, uh, New Mexico has a few things that are working against us in this regard compared to uh, our surrounding states. One relatively old population that's absolutely a given but two you you know we talk a lot on uh this podcast about policies that are business friendly that encourage uh the growth of the private sector in business and we are so far down on those that all the money that we spend on uh K through 12 and then higher education with our uh numerous uh, institutions of higher learning, a lot of those uh, students who actually do really well in those go to other states where the economy is growing uh, faster and there's more opportunity. And so we kind of have a double whammy of that. And so, uh, you know, if there was ever a reason for the teachers union to support a uh, policy of uh, business friendly economic growth, uh, this would seem to be the one, but it's, it just seems to me as though it's just a a step too far to tie those together. You know, those uh, a lot of those factors have been related for a long time and politically are never put uh, juxtaposed against each other, much less tied together. So I have a feeling that unless things change dramatically, this is just going to be something that Again, New Mexico is going to have to deal with, and then how do we allocate better, actually lower levels of resources that are needed to keep our education system going? Or are we going to do what we've done recently is put more and more resources in there, but do it in such a way that we uh, don't get a better outcome? So a couple of interesting issues there. But yeah, this is is the New Mexico problem, uh, and... It, it'll, we'll see it come out more and more places, but I do think it's, it, we're seeing it here, we're seeing it in healthcare, we're seeing it ec- in economic diversification, all three right now. Yeah, I would say uh, the brain drain uh, and decline of our youth population is very high on the list of New Mexico's systemic problems, along with low workforce participation rates, heavy federal government dependency. Uh, those are issues that, uh, quite frankly, define New Mexico's myriad challenges, and how often do those get discussed in Santa Fe? Now, I will give uh, kudos to, uh, I I don't often recommend other podcasts, but uh, KRQE Channel 13 has a podcast on this topic. I link to it at Airs of Enchantment uh, in the broader post on On this, uh, they have a podcast titled More Seniors and Fewer Children. Uh, I believe it's the future of New Mexico. Yeah. And uh, I listened to it all. Uh, They didn't have a heck of a lot of solutions. I offered to come on their show to (laughs) offer a few solutions. Nobody has figured out a solution on the natalism side of thing. The have more babies uh, approach that... uh, that is a very tricky and difficult one, and uh, I'm not sure it's within the scope of our particular show here, but certainly uh, getting more economic activity, more jobs, more diversity uh, would attract people to New Mexico, and uh, many more of those people would be young than the pe- people we're, uh, we're getting now, uh, which, you know, it's better to have older retirees coming here than not, but... Uh, it's not ideal because we're ultimately going to need workers to serve in our economy in the not too distant future. Uh, speaking of diversification of our economy, and uh, on this week's uh, interview with Tom Clifford, I we have a more robust conversation about this. So we're going to kind of just briefly talk about this, but uh, the uh, back and forth on the pages of the Santa Fe New Mexican editorial. <coughs> Uh, between Tom Clifford and Richard Anklum, who would like to eliminate New Mexico's corporate income tax at a so-called cost to the state of 
on the order of $400 million annually, whereas uh, Majority Leader Peter Wurst saying, no, that's a horrible idea. We want to keep taxing out-of-state corporations. This is uh, economic ignorance at its highest. <coughs> Any thoughts on that, Wally? Well, uh, yes, and uh, through the, the miracle of recording the Thursday show before uh, the one that's going out today, a lot of great discussion about some of the reasons that uh, that that arguments are made for and against the income tax. But you know, New Mexico is in a situation to where we are so the sources of revenue are so divorced from the mass population coming through oil and gas and federal government spending, not directly related to what's going on. A place like uh, Colorado that, believe me, uh, is uh, no conservative bastion, has a lot more tie to the economic impacts of its taxation policy than a place even like New Mexico. And then the, uh, a final point I will make on that is that uh, over the years, I've you know places that have gotten rid of their income taxes, states that have gotten rid of it, they've seen a lot of economic benefits that accrue as opposed to places like... Uh, we're specifically now, talking about corporate income Corporate tax, income yeah. tax, as opposed to places like California, <laughs> Illinois, New York, that like really love to tax. Well, they love income taxes of every kind, and they really love their corporate income taxes, have really struggled. And people actually leave those states because uh, the spending grows out of control, and then the that uh, income tax gets uh, put in there. Well, New Mexico has none of those issues. We could certainly reduce uh, or eliminate our corporate income tax. But the thing that wasn't said that I, I have a sense of this over the years is that anytime income taxes are talked about, the progressive element politically actually thinks that income taxes are beyond an economic good, something that's uh, efficient to raise uh, money for governments to succeed. There's almost a moral good. They love them. They can't imagine a world without them because that does something that they've never been able to articulate. But deep down, I think they think that like they have a hard time imagining a world without that. We're in places like Florida, Texas, and uh, many others without it. Heck, Washington State actually have had a lot of benefits from not having an income tax on their corporations. Yeah, it's... Uh... Just uh, check out the conversation with Tom Clifford. It is worth uh, listening to. Tom was Depar Department of Finance and Administration Secretary during the Martinez administration. Uh, he and I uh, have a great conversation about this and a few other issues, but uh, this is the outset, and uh, it's definitely worth 20 or so minutes of your time. Uh, <coughs> amending the U.S. Constitution is not an easy proposition. But uh, it should be, uh, in this regard, to keep nine justices on the U.S. Supreme Court. By keep nine, that is as opposed to 12 or 15 or 7. Uh, or like not-for-profit boards, <coughs> 75 or 100, you know, let's have right. two per state. So, well... Uh, there's a petition at keep9.org, and uh, I would say that there is uh, um, the makings of a national effort and national movement and legislation to, uh, with Republicans in control of both houses of Congress and the presidency, to just keep the U.S. Supreme Court at a nine-member body uh, as amended in the U.S. Constitution. And you know, if things change in the future, you can always uh, change that number uh, for whatever reason, but do it constitutionally. Uh, there were real threats, real points made by Morton Heinrich, uh, Melanie Stansbury, and other progressives that they wanted to uh, add members to the U.S. Supreme Court during the Biden administration in order to fundamentally change the structure of that court and its ideological makeup. And uh, I just don't. Do think they that still be... believe that for over the no, next I four think... years, Paul? Uh, we know they don't. It was I, uh, blatant uh, political uh, 
what should we say, opportunism, if yeah. you will? I don't think you will see much talk about expanding the Supreme Court, but uh, there will be a time in some distant future where uh, Democrats are in a position to add, or Republicans, <coughs> add uh, numbers to the Supreme Court. And uh, it's not in the Constitution. It is an, uh, a number relatively arbitrarily selected. Of course, most famously, Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, att- was attempting to pack the court. It, uh, it wound up succeeding in the sense that he got most of his policies through without actually having to do that. But uh, anyway, it's something that uh, I think it is worth putting in the Constitution. So thoughts, Wally? Yeah, no, I, I think it is. And then uh, the other thought that came to mind is the, you know, the blatant political opportunism that's been involved in this. And so if it's a good idea under one uh under one party in Washington, it should be a good idea under another party in Washington. We know that's not true. But the other thing is, is uh, things like this are difficult to time. You know, you could have, uh, you know, let's just say, for example, that a, uh, a, a constitutional amendment to, uh, to expand the court to whatever, let's pick a number, 15 justices had just passed this last month before the election, the Dems would be celebrating it. What a wonderful thing this was because they were going to be the ones that quote unquote got to pack the court. Well, that's not how it turned out. You know, uh, Trump, uh, the Republican was elected president. And so these things, a lot of times, uh, and you know, the, the other one that's along this line is the filibuster in the Senate. Uh, it's, it's interesting how, uh, when, the D's have had a very small ma- majority in the Senate, but not the 60 votes for cloiture. They're all about getting rid of the filibuster, but not the other way around. You know, the, I know that uh, consistency is part of the hobgoblin of small minds, but these things, <laughs> if they're good for one side, they should be good for the other because they're good governments, governance, not political opportunism. Yeah. Um, I, I could see a time in the future where nine is not the right number for the U.S. Supreme Court, but um, not sure what those circumstances were, would look like. I do agree that it's uh, not something that should be done for blatantly political reasons, and uh, simple as that. So, uh, in terms of uh, election integrity, integrity, let's uh, talk next about a new report from the Heritage Foundation. It actually goes uh, on what people really do care about. Now, uh, our Secretary of State, Maggie Toulouse-Oliver, loves to tout a MIT election lab report that focuses on a few areas that I, I just don't think are super relevant when you talk about national elections issues, uh, a lot more focus on extraneous issues uh, in, in that uh, econo- elections performance index. Uh, so this is the one that the Secretary of State touts in New Mexico is theoretically the top performer. Uh, <coughs> they look at things like voter turnout, voter registration rates, uh, data completeness, online registration available, uh, absentee uh, ballot problems, registrations rejected, uh, post-election audits. I mean, some of this stuff is valuable, but it really, I don't think, gets to the heart of what people care about on both sides of the political aisle in terms of elections. So the Heritage Foundation uh, ranks New Mexico 36th. So we're not at the bottom. We're in that kind of lower uh, third, though. Uh, No surprise there. But what are the variables that the Heritage Foundation looks at? Well, voter ID, uh, no shock there. New Mexico does not do well. We're, we have we score three out of 20 points in that regard. <coughs> Our voter registration lists are actually relatively accurate, 21 out of 28. Absentee ballots, uh, we do okay, 15 of 21 points. Uh, we don't have vote harvesting, which is a good thing. We have uh, election observers. That's a good thing. We have no verification of citizenship. Obviously not a good thing. And uh, it it goes on. But these are the kinds of things, I think, that really 
make people either confident or not confident in our election outcomes. And uh, it won't surprise anybody. California ranked 49th, Hawaii dead last, uh, best states in the country, uh, Georgia, Florida, Tennessee, those are the states that have the best election procedures. And I think voter ID makes a huge difference in this report. If you have voter ID and don't do ballot harvesting, you're in a pretty good place. Um, and I think that's, that's true for election integrity. Yeah, you know, and the other the other aspect to this is, uh, you know, and just a shout out for a earlier podcast, uh, Tipping Point New Mexico 654, where Rod Adair addressed a few of these issues in terms of election integrity, and I thought uh, did a good job. It was very interesting uh, as I was uh, listening to that. But you know, here here's the thing. Um, Voting machines, uh, there's been a lot of talk about those, but, you know, Rod's point was that uh, mail-in ballots are where fraud happens. You mm-hmm. can see where that that would be the case. And then the whole issue about uh, do you have voter ID or not, again, I think that's, that is a, a huge issue. And it's just so interesting to know that uh, – Every other program of government, even those that are are used and benefit the poorest uh, the poorest Americans, whether it be uh, you know uh, food stamps, any kind of welfare, Medicaid, you need an ID. Voting is the one where you don't uh, need an ID. So yeah, it is it is interesting. And then the final point to make uh, is that. You know, Paul, when uh, Microsoft Word had a save as PDF function added to it, mm-hmm. it makes anybody an expert that can put out what used to be a 12-page Word document that can now be turned into a 12-page PDF document that's a quote-unquote study to prove anything about anything. And mm-hmm. so I'm not trying to be particularly harsh about uh, about the, the study that was cited, but the point of it is, is which issues when you're doing a study and going to report the results, the questions you ask are extremely important. And, you know, if you ask the, if you ask misleading questions or you don't ask the right questions from a, uh, public policy point of view, you can kind of lead these things in almost any direction. And you can certainly make it look like it's all above board and scientific and well done. And again, not just to pick on this one, but we see that in study after study. Pick a study. Um, I'll do a study for you that'll show you almost anything you want uh, that has a margin of error of just 3% based on the bad questions that I asked. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, um, The governor recently had a day-long symposium on the future of transportation in New Mexico, Wally. Uh, You want to bet how much had to do with issues that you and I might actually consider real transportation Okay, flying cars were those? I wish. Okay, I've been promised flying cars since I believe it was about (laughs) second or third grade. Um, Paul, this is one, unfortunately, I've read ahead. Oh. What is the number one transportation infrastructure item in New Mexico was not addressed, if I read uh, the post correctly? Well, the number one, I would say, uh, would be New Mexico's broken capital outlay process and the inability to m- maintain and uh, improve our transportation network. Which uh, means roads. Which means roads, yes. Uh, I would throw out uh, the boondoggle that is the the rail runner and it's uh, pollution and the problems that it creates. Uh, well, let's, let's go back to what she actually puts on. <laughs> yeah. The what was, what was on there? If well, there's no flying cars and there's no roads. Uh, the nine thirty to ten fifteen AM panel grid modernization and resilience. So that is just the implication that we're all going to be riding, uh, driving in electric vehicles, and that we need to improve the electrical grid in order to keep our EVs going. Uh, I mean, the grid needs to be reliable more so than it is now for EVs, but... Well, uh, yeah, and the bottom line is, 
We need more electricity if we're going to ever have EVs take off in a major way. A right. lot, lot more. Uh, charging network and EV infrastructure. Uh, that's number. That's your ten fifteen. And to who 11 the heck's going to do it for less than a hundred thousand dollars per charger? Yeah. Uh, electrification of transportation fleets. So we're three for three. This is the eleven fifteen okay, to eleven forty five. All EVs a. all the time. Yes. Uh, now, Rob Black, our friend. Uh, Economic Development Secretary, uh, he got a real panel, the intersection between infrastructure development and responsive procurement. So I guess some kind of uh, procurement-related panel uh, seems titillating, to say the least. And then we get into... Well, now, did they address Little Davis Bacon and all of that? That I don't know. Yeah, I did not attend yeah. this lovely uh, But it'd event. be interesting to see how uh, ma making your tax dollar go farther is what that one could be called. So uh, the afternoon, uh, you get resilient transportation infrastructure, which uh, that really means uh, ensuring that roads and bridges can withstand climate challenges like extreme heat, drought, and flooding. Okay, I'm... I mean, I'm sure that roads can be damaged by, you know, as they are by snow and heat and whatnot, but this is like their global warming panel. And then transportation for sustainable communities, uh, walkable, bikeable, multimodal communities, re reducing reliance on personal vehicles and sustainability, blah, blah, blah. So nothing that I would consider relevant. You know, it's, it's the thing is that a lot of the issues that we talk about with this governor and the political people managing New Mexico, it's not that we disagree with them. We do. It's that they don't even want to have the discussion about the relevant topics at hand. That is my, I think, more broad statement about this, the situation is in our state. Yeah, you know, and one of the, one of the, if I were putting together, it's like the elephant in the room, Paul. EVs heavier and harder on roads and don't pay road taxes. What are we going to do about it? That would For be, example. Should we tax EVs? That would be well, a we nice don't, conversation. So, yeah. 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 Uh, I know. It's a very brief <laughs> conversation. You could have a debate, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Should we or shouldn't we? We should. We shouldn't. Yeah. Have a good day. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Davis Bacon would be a lovely one. Um you know, uh, public-private partnerships would be good. Uh, you know, something maybe about the border and uh, how we may want to address uh, free trade and the flow of goods uh, from Mexico. Other, I'm sure there's other interesting ideas out there, but, uh, you know, yeah, EVs, all EVs all the time. Well. Um, Final story, Santa Fe, New Mexican, Daniel Chacon reports, the state auditor found multiple instances of wasteful spending and improper use of funds at Western New Mexico University. Uh, I don't know why their president, John Joseph Shepard, is still there, but uh, he was found to have broken a lot of rules. Uh, for example, he took trips paid for by the university that appear unrelated to official university business. Uh, that's that's a problem. Uh, he did not submit vouchers and travel documentation that uh, you know for reimbursement that would have uh, indicated how much he spent uh, or justified how much he was supposed to be reimbursed for. Uh, he had international travel and upgrades that uh, lacked justification uh, in the form of documentation. One that I really liked is his wife, Valerie Plame, uh, made her name back in the early 2000s as a CIA agent uh, uh, blowing the whistle on George W. Bush, ran for Congress District 3 in 2020. Uh, she had a university credit card, not as an employee of the university, but simply being married to the president. I, I know Western New Mexico is close to home for you, Wally. Yeah, it is near and dear to my heart. Uh, that's where my dad was. Uh, he was the basketball coach, uh, worked in admissions and uh, athletic director for most of his career. Um, yeah, I have definitely a soft spot. Uh, so 
I will not in any way attempt to uh, say that this isn't an important issue and wasting of taxpayer funds at any amount in any kind is important. Uh, I, I do think that this is a big deal that should be gotten to the bottom of. What it does remind me of, Paul, is uh, the question that came to mind and still does is that, uh, you know, what did uh, President Shepard do to uh, get on somebody's bad side where they dug into all of this and found it? And the only reason I say that is if you look at uh, fraud, waste, and abuse in New Mexico government, the amounts talked about here are a pittance. You know what I mean? And I'm not... Again, I am not making the point that this isn't important, but it's like, uh, well, you know what? If uh, we don't put our auditors uh, auditing some people we don't like, they're going to come audit us, is the thought that came to mind for me when this story first broke. You know, and it's been out there a number of years now. So it's been out there, and he's managed uh, President Shepard to uh, maintain that. So, uh, yeah, we will we'll see what what happens. It is amazing that every now and then the ethics of uh, wasting government money is uh, is exposed and punished, but it's always when there's a personal benefit involved, not wasting it in huge amounts on other things. So uh, both are important, and believe me, again, not advocating this. And uh, you know what? Having the uh, having a university credit card for your spouse does that's not a good look under the best of circumstances, much less if uh, any inappropriate uh, things were done. But yeah, we will see how this one plays out. And maybe, uh, maybe once it's over, we'll go to auditing the uh, fraud, waste and abuse and the rest of state government, because boy, it's there. We know it is, Uh, but uh, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars here. We know that there's programs, and I have my own that I could list out, that are in the millions, tens of millions, and hundreds of millions of dollars of fraud and abuse. Let's work on those as well. Yeah, I think it's safe to say that there's uh, legal corruption, uh, which is a much bigger form of corruption, and then the illegal form of corruption, which is what this actually entails. And well, and this one is easy to understand what he yeah. did wrong, too. You know, right. a lot of the legal corruption is very difficult to explain and people's eyes glaze over. You bought a bunch of expensive stuff that didn't seem like it benefited the university. That's pretty easy to understand. Yeah, and he should be held accountable for it. And uh, uh, I would expect that that would involve the loss of his job. But, uh, you know, we'll we'll see. And I'm sure we'll be able to report. But... Uh, there are certainly bigger instances of waste, fraud, and abuse, and uh, many of them happen with the uh, gleeful participation of uh, our political leadership and uh, sometimes many even the celebration of our yeah. political oh, leadership. And, and, and our <laughs> population. So, yeah. so, all right. Well, with that, thanks for listening to this week's episode. Find all episodes at tippingpointsnm.com or at the Rio Grande Foundation's YouTube channel. Subscribe to the show at Apple, Stitcher, or tell Google Home to play Tipping Point New Mexico. Thanks to Bathory Marketing for producing this show.